I like this one. Did you ever get up in the morning, look at yourself in the mirror and think, that can't be accurate? <laughs> or maybe you're like this gal. We know all mirrors don't lie. I'm just grateful they don't laugh. <laughs> and my favorite one of all, do you see this dog kind of leaning up against there? Hello, beautiful. You look amazing today. Right. I don't know what you're like. Happy of my, if my mirror would say that, but you know, not so much. Today we're starting a new sermon series entitled uh, Bible Characters with Character. And we're going to be looking each month, so through the last part, uh, this part of May, we're going to be looking at uh, the creation story. And uh, through the first cha two chapters of Genesis, we're going to be looking at the different uh, characters that we see through that story and what that all means to us. So we're starting in Genesis chapter 126, and you can follow along in your New Testaments if you wish, or just read it off here. Genesis 126 starts, And God said, Let us make man in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the sky and over the livestock and all the wild animals and all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the sky and then every living creature that moves on the ground. And God said, I'll give you every seed bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit will have seed in it. These will be yours for food. And to all the beasts of the earth and all the birds of the sky and all the creatures that move uh, along the ground, everything that has breath of life in it, I give every green plant for food. And so and it was so. God saw that all that he made, and it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the beauty and the glory of creation. We thank you for the privilege of being created beings. We thank you for the privilege of being your children, your workmanship. And Father, as we look today at the image of God and what that means for each one of us, we pray that you would help us to examine ourselves and see where we are in our relationship with you. And that we understand your love and your grace through Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. And that forgiveness that we have of sins. And that new life that we're given. We ask it today in Jesus, in the name of Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Amen. So... One of the key verses that we find in here, we started the passage, is that we are created in God's image. I want us to take a, a look at that. I couldn't find the graphic for it, so that's fine. But if you remember in the show, you remember the TV show, some people my age will, um, All the Family? Okay, it's my dad's favorite show. It was my favorite show because our Jubunker reminded me of my dad. And my dad didn't recognize it, which made it all the more fun. So every time he laughed at the jokes, I laughed harder. Because, yep, that'd be you, Dad. Yep, okay. So, but uh, in the show, Archie Bunker, blue-collar worker, you know, trying to do his thing. And uh, uh, he, uh, he would oftentimes say things that were kind of uh, interesting. And he'd get in fights with his uh, son-in-law, uh, uh, whatever his name was. Uh, media is what he called him, you know, dead from the head, neck up. And uh, they used to get fights, and because Meathead was delightfully liberal and, you know, all this. And so they got all these great political discussions that you couldn't get into nowadays without people shooting at each other. Those days you could just argue and kind of laugh at it. It was rather fun. Well, one time they got on this whole subject of the Bible and everything, and uh, I think Archie went to church and everything, and he was trying to say something about we're created in the image of God. To which Michael responds, you mean God looks like you? 
because you didn't know what to do with that, really. But uh, in a sense, yes. Okay? When we look at each other, we are looking at the face of God. And how yeah, you think, well, wow, God that has that many faces? Oh, yes, he does. And again, in our finite minds, we can't really put that together, but in, in God's sense, we really, really can. So, we are created in the image of God. Now, being created in God's image means being created in his essence, but also the personality and ethics of God. We'll talk about that more in a few minutes. The essence of God, your big word for the day, ethropomorphic, um, well, for an example, Zechariah 4.10, this explains what I mean. Who dares displease, who dares despise the day of small things since the seven eyes of the Lord that range throughout the earth will rejoice when they see the chosen capstone, capstone in the hand of Zerubbabel. Okay? So God is described as having eyes, isn't he? Isn't that fascinating? Described as seven eyes? What does that mean? Well, seven is perfect and complete. So what that means is that, that God sees everything. He sees um, what we do what we don't do, what we should do, what we don't end up doing. And he sees all of those things. He looks around at our world. He sees the, uh, the condition of what's going on, this, the, the war that's over in Ukraine, all these things are no surprise to God. Doesn't that God see the suffering? I remember that movie, remember that movie, uh, Oh God, George Burns and John Denver? ditzy premise, but I do remember, <laughs> I do remember one line in that movie where John Denver collects all of these things that we would like to ask God when we get to heaven. Well, he's got God, or actually George Burns, but he comes up to him, he's got this whole list of stuff, and the first thing in the list he says to him, you know, God, if you're all loving, why do you allow hunger in the world? He looks back at him, he says, why do you allow it? In other words, we ask God that, why do we allow pain, suffering, or conflict, all that? And God asks us right back, why do you allow it? Why do you permit that in your world? Why do you permit that in your government? Which is a democratic government, supposedly, and we can elect our, issue, our issues. And before you can slip, we can elect our, um, uh, whatever I'm trying to say, the leaders. Why are we allowing it? Fascinating question. And so God's eye sees everything. The Lord's hand was against them until they completely eliminated them from the camp. What a fascinating thing. So God has a hand that moves and works still in our life today. Remember that you were a slave in Egypt and that the Lord your God brought you out of there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Sounds like one of the choruses we sing. Therefore the Lord your God has commanded you to observe the Sabbath day. His mighty what? It's in the passage. His mighty hand and his outstretched what? Arm. arm. Do you know we had car seats back when I was a kid? Sure you did. It was called Mom's Arm. You know. Dad would slam on the brakes and I'd get decapitated right there. Boom. Thanks, Mom. Give me chest compression. It's good. I will not die. All right? But she just did. That was automatic. Like every mom did that. Their right arm must have had instructions at birth. Take care of this arm because you're going to protect your kids for the next 50 years. And so he has an arm that outstretches and helps all of that. In my distress, I called the Lord. I cried to the Lord for help from his temple. He what, heard my voice, and my cry came before him into his ears. Our prayers reach God's ears. Amen? 
God hears us when we pray. Romans tells us that even if I am too distraught to pray, you ever been like that? Where I'm just so full with emotions and with difficulty, I don't even know how to pray. I can't even get a word out hardly. Grief will do that sometimes. God will even pray for us. The Holy Spirit will come in, intercede, and pray for us to a God who already knows what we're getting ready to say. In other words, all that to say that God knows us intimately, inside and out, and our deepest struggles, our struggles in our heart. It may be with stuff going on in the world, maybe stuff going on in the family, maybe stuff going on in our hearts, stuff that maybe we don't share with anybody else because we're worried how they would react and what they might say. And we have a God who knows that even before we get a word articulated, and he loves us anyway. Amen? Oh, yeah. He loves us anyway, anyhow. We can also see the face of God, familiar passage, 2 Chronicles seven fourteen says, If my people, who are called by my name, what are we? Christians, get the idea? Okay. Will humble themselves <laughs> and pray. Notice what's first, humility. Good. And pray. And seek what? My things. My things. And turn from their wicked ways. See, if we turn from our wicked ways, we can be facing God and we can see his face. But I gotta turn from my wicked ways because when I'm focused on my wicked ways, I'm focusing in the wrong direction. I can't see them. Why? Because I'm in the wrong direction. I can turn and seek his face that he will hear from heaven. I will hear from heaven. He says, forgive their sin and heal their land. Don't we need that? Some of the great, pre one of the great preachers, I can never remember if it was Spurgeon or Billy Sunday, one of those, um, said, we need a revival. Right? That wakes somebody up, sorry. No, I'm not. It's kind of funny. But he says, we need a revival. Then he draws a circle of chalk on the dirt. He stands there and he says, and Lord, let it begin in this circle. So revival of a family starts with a revival of us individually. A revival in our community starts with each one of us. A revival in our country starts with us and starts with people who have also decided that they want to have that revival and then things can happen in our world. Wonderful things, magnificent things, with always that most important caveat that is God's will be done. Hardest prayer to pray. Hardest prayer to pray. Thy will be. I always like to say it, my will be done. Wouldn't it be great if I ran the world? That's not true. That's a good thing. God and I have this agreement. He runs the world, I don't. But I gotta remember my part of the deal, right? That I'm not trying to take control. I'm not trying to do everything my way, that I'm not the smartest guy in the room. Who is God? I mean, I remember in Bible college, seminary, these guys, we had guys that were teaching us that had four to five PhDs. These guys have forgotten more Bible than I'll ever know. But what they would always say is, don't take my word for this. Go back home, go back to your rooms, read your Bible, and check to see if what I'm saying is true. And, there's, and they'll say to these guys, with all this education, there's still so much about the Bible I don't know. To which my first response was, okay, good, I'm done. No. <laughs> just means I have to study harder. But it gave me a bit of encouragement that these guys were just spiritual giants, both in their academic preparations, but also in their life. These were great guys. Joni and I were talking about that yesterday. We had, she had some, a procedure done uh, when I was in graduate school. And, um, and a little touch and go there for a little bit. And I remember the, uh, the chairman of the uh, doctrine department, guy, again, five or six PhDs, real sharp. He sees me in the hallway, shifts direction, comes over, grabs me by the shoulders, 
and says, how is your wife? That's all he was concerned about. And then, things went out, it turned out well, obviously. And on my final exam, I wish this had caused him to raise the grade a little higher, but you know, that goes. But next to my grade, he wrote on my final exam, glad your wife's doing okay. Who does that? A man of God. No matter how much education he has, his heart right with God, living in his image. And not only do we seek God's face, but when I consider your heavens, the psalmist says, the work of your fingers. Not only his hand, but his finger, his finger. The moon and the stars which you have set in place. A number of years ago, I remember uh, Wendy's uh, first husband, Rich, and I, we shared a love of a number of things. Um, uh, BC comics, uh, banjo music. He came in excitedly and had me look up on my computer. Uh, I tell you, um, uh, Steve Martin, the comedian, is also a really good banjo player. Really good. And he was on David Letterman one night, and there he was, about six other banjo players, including the famous Earl Scruggs who is candidly one of the best banjo players ever to have lived. And they were playing that popular tune, Foggy Mountain Breakdown. Oh, my. if you like any of that kind of music, just Google Dave Letterman, Earl Scruggs, you know, Steve Martin, and you will have a treat. And I'm watching these guys doing this kind of stuff, and I'm looking at my hand going, why can't you boys get organized like that? Oh, it was amazing. Now, you multiply that speed and that technique and that know-how by about a trillion, and you begin to see a little bit about what the finger of God can do in your life. That kind of power. We know what human fingers are capable of. But what are the fingers of God capable of? And then we have not only that, but the voice. Did you remember reading the very first verses in Revelation when God said, Let God said, let there be light. And there was light. Wow. And John's Gospel, that we're studying in Sunday school, in the beginning was what? The Word. And the Word was with God. And in verse 14, the Word was God. In the beginning was the Word. Jesus is known as the Word of God. True or false, the Bible is the Word of God. False. False. It is the written record of the Word of God, who is Jesus Christ. Now, whether you're reading the Word here, you're reading it up there, it's the rec written record and recording of the Word of God, who is Jesus Christ. The Bible does not save me, but Jesus Christ, who died on the cross and is the power of salvation for those who believe the Jew, for some of the Greek, the be us. That's the power of God is Jesus Christ. I don't pray in the name of the scriptures. I pray in the name of Jesus. Because that's the name. The name of all, above all names. The name under which every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is what? Lord. And even his feet. We've gone through all these body parts, right? And the God of Israel under his feet. <laughs> With something like pavement made of lapsus lazuti, as bright blue as the sky. Wow. Under his feet. Incidentally, you'll read in the scripture many, many times about God and Jesus Christ that God will place all these things under where his feet. So you could step on it. Everything that's important will be under the feet of God. Why? Because he is so great. And our world is so technical theological world, technical theological term here. You ready for it? I want to take notes. Here it is. Our world is screwed. Right? Okay. I'm not going to get any argument out of that, right? But I don't know what tomorrow holds, but I know who holds tomorrow, right? We do. We know exactly who holds tomorrow. And so we are made in God's image. Now, 
I made a mistake during the children's sermon. I taught him a fun song. It wasn't the song I was planning to teach them. Joey's looking at me like, yeah, you're going to do another song. Yeah, okay, well, should have sang louder here, okay? So the song I was going to teach them, I'll teach you right now. You know this. Be careful, little eyes, what you see. Oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see. For the Father up above is looking down in love. Oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see. And if you want the rest of the verses, just go through the body parts. Be careful, little feet, where you go. Be careful, little ears, what you hear. Okay, all of that. That's what we're called to do. If I'm created in the image of God, the essence of God, which talks about maybe the anthropomorphic physical parts, I should lift my eyes. God's eyes that see everything, my eyes should see what is pleasing to God. My ears listen to things that are pleasing to God. My mouth should be saying things that are pleasing to God. See, you can speak God's word in a sense without necessarily quoting the Bible. Really? How do I do that? Well, what did we say that God's word is? God's word is Jesus. And if I am speaking in a manner in which Jesus would have me to do and sharing his message and his kindness and his humility and his love and all of those things, we'll talk about those in a second. If I share all of those things, I'm speaking the word of Jesus. I'm blessed each week. I, I get the word of Jesus all the time. I get people coming in, people I'm on the phone with that are really speaking the word of God. And sometimes I can find myself speaking words. Jesus said he'll give you words if you don't know what to say. And sometimes I'm speaking words and somebody will say, wow, that was really wonderful. <laughs> Got news for you. It ain't me, folks. Guess who it is. Starts with J, ends with S. See if you can figure it out. Okay? That's the word you're hearing. We have to see. Now see, Adam and Eve were created in the image of God. We talked about the essence of God a little bit through the different parts that we talked about. But Adam and Eve, they also saw that ethics, in other words, um, people who are, uh, his ethics, com compassion, love, patience, mercy, grace, those things expended. And some of those tend to be attributes that we typically move toward and think about in terms of women. Now, and, and there's a whole bunch of scholarly debate about, well, is God a woman? No. Well, yes. <laughs> he is. That messes with you. Is he a man? Yes. Is he a woman? Yes. How can he be both? We aren't going to figure that out until we get to heaven, folks. Because it makes no sense down here. And some of you may be shaking your head, no, he's not a woman. Well, he, but he has attributes that are feminine, okay? He's compassionate. A lot of guys are, you know, I'm a macho, macho man, and I'm, I get village people coming to my neighborhood. Okay. But um, you've got stuff, well, guys can't be compassionate and forgiving and loving and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, they can. And candidly, they really should. A number of months ago, we had kind of a group that was meeting here that candidly didn't Art, it didn't advertise. And it was a group, um, American Restoration Ministry. I can't remember what the R was. Essentially, it was for battered women. Women who had been abused physically, sexually, all those things. They met at our office. We had somebody that many of you would know uh, leading the group, great group. So me, whenever I'm faced with something kind of new, I buy a book. I was forced to, eh, no. I mean, I've got a library. I wanted to see, I, I've done a lot of reading on, on abu the abuse victims, male and female. I've done a lot of study on that. Kind of interned a little bit with a counseling group, when it had a council, start support groups, all that stuff. But I was reading stuff about what causes somebody to be an abuser. Wow. And sometimes, it's a learned habit. Guess where it's learned from? The guys will learn it from their fathers. But also, there's a societal 
factor, which I didn't realize. And so I'm cautious about what I say. It, w the worst thing that you can say to a boy when he's starting to practice athletics, you throw like a ah. Shouldn't say that. Can't believe because I know girls can throw a whole lot better than I can. But more accurately, it, it, it's not a, a way, it, it's, it's a demeaning thing. And it plants a seed of somebody that women quite aren't as important as guys. And kids pick up on that like you wouldn't believe, even little ones. And so be careful, little mouths, what we say, right? And Jesus, <laughs> he had women around him all the time that traveled with him in the twelve. Mary Magdalene, who he had cast demons out of, was very present at the resurrection. A lot of that focused around her. It's important. And so, and I always tell guys, okay, careful what you say to your sons, because they're going to pick up on it. And how they treat women is the way that you treat their mom. And guys, if you have daughters, I've been harping with my son on this one. If you have daughters, you need to honor them, treasure them. And yes, that might mean you're sitting at a little pink table with your 10 tea and you can't move because your legs are cramped and you're having a tea party. And that's what you need to do as fathers so that your daughters do not end up in my office in 15 years talking about having daddy issues, right? Keaton, Tom, you talk to people over that, right? Of course you have. So guys, it's your responsibility. You raise your daughters that they are loved, they are honored, they are cherished, they are worth it. And you've already told them what will happen if they bring a boyfriend over you don't like. You know, you got a gun, you got a shovel, there are six acres back there, and nobody's going to come looking for him for at least a week. Oh, sorry, did I say that? I, mine was just the easy one. I just said, you make my daughter cry, I make you cry. Okay, that's, they figured it out. But it comes down to what we teach our sons and our daughters to stem the, to break through the cycle of abuse that seems to be prevalent in our world today. It's not talked about, and it's definitely not preached about. That's why I'm preaching something about it, because it needs to be said in the church. And it needs to be dealt with in the church, because if you are, we need to deal with you. If you know somebody, and I suspect many of you do, either a victim or a perpetrator, you're the lifeline to Christ that they desperately need. We need to live in God's image. What would my eyes do? What would my ears do? How do I act like Jesus? How do I have the compassion, the grace, the mercy, the love of Jesus in my heart? And how can I extend that? That's how people see God, by looking at the people who are created in his image and showing that image so much that they can literally see the face and the beauty Somebody sent this to me, I was like fascinated by it, and I like to read about a composer, a musician, so I like to read about it, read something, read something, I didn't know. Johann Sebastian Bach, okay? So if you do classical music at all, you've heard of uh, Bach. He was living in a time where children sometimes didn't live too long because they didn't have the doctors and stuff they have today. Bach lost his little daughter, and his three sons to illness, an illness which then just soon afterwards claimed his wife. So he lost his wife, his daughter, and three sons to an illness. He remarried, then he and his second wife, Anna Magdalena, lost four more daughters and three sons. And you have a man who is composing music, having lost one wife and 11 kids. 
And the question posed by this scholar is, how in the world can you even get up in the morning? Much less write music. And not only music, but some of the most beautiful music that the world has ever known and it's ever seen. How can you write concertos and masses and concerts? But here's how he did it. At the, at the end of each piece, he would always get these words in there somehow. So like Deo Gloria, Latin for glory to God above. At the end of every piece that he wrote, short, long, whatever, every piece, glory to God. And at the beginning of the piece, he would write, Lord, help me. Beginning of each piece, Lord, help me. At the end of it, glory to God. Actually, you can pray through Bach's music because it starts as a prayer and it ends as a prayer. And it was written to, by a man who knew full well, full well, the losses that we had as people who were in the image of God. He knew what loss was, heart, heartache, difficulty, trial, struggles. And his response is praying to God who can help us in any and all situations. I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. Philippians 4.13 tells me. And so this morning, do me a favor, if I had, I don't have to be weird about it, just turn and look at somebody. I told you not to be weird, Terry. Okay. <laughs> just, just look at somebody. Okay. Now, Terry, a chip was created in the image of God, isn't he? He is indeed. And she is too, even when she's being weird. Okay. You're talking about people who are created in God's image, which is interesting because when they're created in God's image, when I figured this out a few years ago, actually it was on a trip to Mexico, on a missions trip, this God just revealed this to me. And I'm looking at all these kids, I'm thinking, this is the face of God through Jesus Christ. And it really impacts how I, I talk to them, how I listen to them, how I react to them, how I respond to them what I say, what I do, how I pray. And so this morning as we come for our time of invitation and dedication, I ask that we sing this song. Burdens are lifted by self-help books and people that you find on the internet and all that, right? No, burdens are lifted where? Yes. At Calvary. Lifted forward on the cross, lifted to it by God, Jesus, that image, in human flesh, came here, had no sin to become our sin, and thus we could become the righteousness of God through Jesus Christ. So if you have burdens today, they're lifted by the only one who can do that, and that's Jesus Christ. Let's stand and sing this wonderful song together. If you have a decision you'd like to share with us or, or need prayer, Elder is always happy to pray uh, for you and with you. Um, let's sing this wonderful song today. Burdens are lifted. <laughs>